if I can kick it off. Let's do it. Thank you. I, I do not want to be the guy who's planted up here talking the whole time. So I was like, I'm going to talk some of my friends into uh, taking moments. So thank you, Pate. Appreciate your support. And uh, Pete, I want to call you out as well. Uh, they're not joking when it's uh, like the role of serving on a team that leads uh, and provides, helps come around a leader like me is uh, it's a big task. And uh, I often come into meetings with like six new ideas and they're like, breaks, breaks. <laughs> so there's a lot of that, um, but also a lot of prayer and a lot of uh, encouragement. So really grateful for you guys investing for, it's almost two years now. Um, I, this morning, I thought I'd just start out and I echo what, what Pate just said. My gratitude for you guys wanting to take time to sit in a room and hear about what, what's up with Dad Awesome? What's up with this ministry? Why is your family moving into an RV for the next nine months? Uh, these questions and your care for our family and for this mission to go forward uh, matters greatly. So thank you for being here. And my, my prayer is that uh, your time investment of saying, I'll, I'll give you a couple hours, um, the seed of like, I'm here for you. I pray that the seed of uh, back in your own life as a grandparent, as a parent, as a future parent, that uh, I, I'm praying for miracles back into your life. This is not a ministry, this is not an evening about me and about the ministry, but it's actually, we all can walk away changed because of just spending a little bit of time together. So that, that's my prayer going into tonight. This morning, as I, read, uh, as I read the book of John, I think it was chapter four or five, the story of uh, the healing that took place at the pool of Bethesda. Um, some of you guys nod maybe a little bit if you know the story. Um, so I learned this morning, though, uh, this healing that Jesus did, this place where there was a pool that was kind of stirred up and people were trying to get into it. When an angel would stir the waters, they'd get healed if they were the first one in the pool. Uh, I learned this morning that the area of Bethesda in Hebrew is Beit Hesad. Now, if you guys know how to speak Hebrew, I probably got it wrong, but many of you don't. So I'll just go with Beit Hesad. Um, it means house of loving kindness. Beit uh, means house of the father, the first Hebrew word there. And Hesad means love, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, mercy, devotion, favor. But none of those words, those descriptors are enough by themselves. It's like this blend of all this goodness. So they say that uh, the term the best uh, definition of the Bethesda is house of loving kindness, but yet the visual was hundreds of people who were lame, who were blind, and paralyzed that were, were in really bad shape trying to get healed and stuck in a place of wishing the miracle was theirs, but it wasn't. So that was the visual, but the place is called house of loving kindness, and Jesus showed up in the place that looks like there's no hope here, looks like there's a lot of like uh, a lot of people in a lot of need. He spoke life and he spoke and did a miracle without the pool at all. It was Jesus who did the change. And my prayer over all of us in the room, all of us that watch this video at some point, and over all the dads that we get a chance to, to, to pour into, is the state of fatherhood globally and in the country um, is not great. It's actually probably, if you're going to use a visual, a visual of hundreds of people who are lame and blind and in rough shape, that may be the state of fatherhood. Uh, the state of fatherlessness would also have a visual of great despair and hopelessness. Um, but Jesus, the house of loving kindness, that was a place where miracles happened. And I think the miracles are going to start with our homes. Not a bunch of ministries, but our homes, the people in the room. It's going to start with a small group actually having houses of loving kindness and experiencing the miracles of God, and that will ripple out. So none of this happens. I actually said this early on in the podcast with Dad Awesome. It's like as soon as my girls, as soon as the Zog girls, which at that point was two, we had two daughters when this thing kicked off, and I thought I was doing an okay job with a four-year-old and a one-year-old. I was like, I could start a ministry called Dad Awesome. Now today, <laughs> four daughters, almost nine, six, four, they all have birthdays coming up in a month, and in uh, one, like, I would not start a ministry and call it Dad Awesome, because I'm like, there's all kinds of areas that I'm like, I am not Dad Average, at best, Dad Awful often. <laughs> dad Awesome, it's uh, aspiration. And so you name it what you're going after, I want to be Dad Awesome, but I want to have a house of loving kindness. And I want that for my home, and I want that for the homes of everyone who listens to the podcast and that ride the, the rides. And I just think we can, let's lean in and believe for a miracle that it's not a place of, uh, it was a 38-year-old dude who was healed, 38 years of waiting for the healing. And uh, I think there's some 38-year-old dads that are waiting for the healing and that it's going to start with their house being a house of loving kindness, them experiencing a miracle, and then it goes out to generations to come. So uh, that visual was powerful for me, and that was this morning. So 
Now can we get to the real talk? Is that good? I had to start there, I had to start there. Um, okay, so the outline where we're going uh, on your little uh, table tent. How many pl places do you go and they hand you a table tent? Well, we handed you a table tent this evening. And uh, it starts with intention. We're gonna talk about the fumbling phase. We're gonna go into celebration, the foundation phase, into vision, a few years of vision, the framing phase, and vision, a few decades, the future phase. Can I, can I walk us through a few of these? But I promise it won't just be me talking. I'm gonna interrupt myself with tapping a few of you guys to come up and talk. And, uh, but I do think it's important for you to just hear kind of like this is where we've been and this is where we feel like God is leading. Uh, it matters greatly for me to get to share that. If, if, I'm very encouraged you guys want to hear. Um, the door's that way. If you leave now, bummer. But uh, I think it's going to be worth it. I think it's going to be worth it. Here we go. So the intention, we'll start with intention, the why behind Dad Awesome. So this all started from a conversation with my wife's cousin's husband who said, man, you f it seems like you're being an intentional dad. How do you stay so intentional about being a dad? And I answered him, if you look at intentionality in my life, my mentors and the conversation topics with my mentors, books I'm reading, podcasts I'm listening to, retreats I've gone to, small groups I've been a part of, none of those things, if you looked at them, have been anywhere in the realm of these are about intentional fatherhood. So I was trying to grow in other areas in my life, but like a lot of those core areas, I did not see intentional fatherhood as like, that's an area I wanna be super intentional about. Um, I was just enjoying being a young dad and having little kids. So I realized with his question, I wasn't actually putting that much intentionality and I wasn't helping my friends on this pathway that later I realized is the pathway of becoming dad awesome. So I filled out an Evernote file on the flight home from Arizona with ideas. The next morning I bought 10 web URLs, domain names for different fatherhood names of ministries. Uh, so yeah, you buy the URLs first, and then you create the ministry second, right? Is that, is that the order? So one of them was dad awesome. I, I was a children's pastor at the time, and I was offering nothing to the families in my church to help them with this pathway of being dad awesome. Uh, I was dedicating babies every other month, praying over families. They'd come, families in the church and families adjacent to the church, just kind of barely connected. And they'd come because baby dedication was maybe part of their tradition. Like, hey, we should do this. We should get our baby prayed over. I'd pray over them and give them nothing to help them in this pathway of being an intentional dad. So I realized, hey, I'm not doing much here. Our church isn't doing much. Let's try something. And Dad Awesome started from just an attempt to try something to spark uh, a movement towards, man, I love being a dad, and I have some tools to be an intentional dad. Like, it was just, it started that way. And it was 10 episodes of me doing reflections on our 10 family values that I called Dad Awesome episode one through 10. And then I was like, so I have nothing else to give after 10 weeks. So it began after uh, episode 11 and forward. It was an interview-based podcast. Is all it was. I was a children's pastor doing a podcast. Um, episode one dropped. And the next day, my dad uh, rushed to the hospital. And we knew something was wrong. Um, the next day after episode one, this is in January of 2018. Uh, the next hundred weeks were a journey of trusting God, of praying for miracles, of weekly releasing every single week an episode of Dad Awesome, this podcast, this resource, trying to help be helpful in the area of intentional fatherhood. While I did that, my biggest encourager during those first hundred weeks of the ministry, say, the entrepreneurial, um, uh, you know, person that I see as being an amazing visionary and entrepreneur, my dad, Chuck Sog, encouraged me, listened to all the episodes, prayed for me, shared ideas with me, and a healing journey of 100 weeks with my dad uh, paralleled a, uh, a journey of launching this ministry. Episode 100 launched, and the next day my dad went home to heaven. And the first 100 weeks, though I call the phase fumbling phase on here, on your guide here, it's the fumbling phase. It was all about intention. Let's try things. Let's do something in this area. And I grew more and more passionate as I just tried more things. And those things, I mean, we were all over the place. I'll mention them in a moment, some of the actual resources we did. But it was just, let's try this. Let's try that. Uh, it was 100 weeks of trusting God. 100 weeks of getting a little closer to heaven because my dad was getting closer to heaven. And that's my prayer, is that this ministry would help dads get a little closer to heaven, help their homes be places of loving kindness that are a little closer to heaven. And uh, I don't think it was, I, I think it was, it was an absolute gift because I experienced a healing journey with my dad while launching the foundation of this ministry. And, uh, and what happened about a year after my dad passed away, so this was a summer ago, last summer, so this was two years ago my dad went to heaven, is I actually was encouraged by a mentor to write 
on a piece of paper, one side, these are all the ways your dad got it right. Like, dad, thank you for these things. I listed them all out on one side of the piece of paper. On the other side of the piece of paper, I listed out, dad, these are things that were hard or that caused some pain or that, man, this was tough for me. And the cool thing was the flip side of the paper were things that I talked to my dad about already because we enjoyed that, we, we, not enjoyed, we went there and experienced healing and prayer together about that side of the paper. But instead of just a piece of paper, you know, a lot of men's retreats, write the thing on the piece of paper and let's burn it in the fire. Well, I decided because um, my family went the night before we threw rocks into the lake to kind of remember moments and memories of my dad. I didn't have a, I threw a rock that day, but I, I had a plan for the next day that I didn't tell any of my family about. It was a year later before my family learned. I took a rock the size of a large laptop um, and I wrote on one side of the rock with a sharpie words that describe the first side. Dad, I'm thank you, thank you for these things. On the other side of the rock, I wrote the words that describe the areas of pain and hurt. And I swam that rock to the middle of the lake. And as I'm swimming, it's a heavy rock, I'm experiencing weight. And I think the weight that I was experiencing on my way out to the middle of the lake is the weight that most dads um, carry every single day as they try to bring love to their kids, as they try to bring encouragement to their family. Most dads are carrying weight because there's a whole line of things in our past that have been hurt hard. There's hard things. There's loss. There's disappointment. I prayed my dad would be healed. He wasn't. There's a lot of emotions in carrying that rock to the middle of the lake. But I don't think God's heart is for any of us dads, any of us men, any of us people to actually walk and swim with that kind of weight. I don't think it's God's heart for us. Uh, but I got to experience and feel it. Swam to the middle, prayed, God, thank you for the gift of my dad, and thank you for the gift of being my heavenly father who's still fathering me. And I dropped the rock. And uh, it's one of those moments, I, my eyes were open, I'm watching this massive rock fall into the darkness. And I swam back with just joy in my heart because of the forgiveness and the love and the freedom. Freedom is the core thing here. I get to swim back and be a dad to my girls and pray that they're gonna have a rock someday. They're gonna have some areas that I've caused hurt. Um, but man, I pray that it's a light rock because of the, my heavenly father, his forgiveness and love. I just pray that their rocks are really light. Like they're not a big, heavy rock. And not, I'm not judging my dad and what happened. I'm just saying I can be a dad who steps in and prayerfully brings love and life and not passing on pain to my girls. Um, so I share that story in the intention phase because I pray that we could wake up a generation of dads to how much God loves them. I pray that we could wake up a generation of dads to the forgiveness and freedom that's offered by God so that we don't accidentally pass on pain to our kids. And I pray that we could wake up a generation of dads to a bigger mission. It's not just about them and their house, but actually them being on mission outside of their house is what their, their kids need. It's what my girls need is a dad who has a bigger mission than just raising the four of them. They need to see a dad who's got that spark and that mission that goes beyond them. Um, so that, that's some of my prayer. That was some of my intention. Um, and before I go into celebration, I just want to acknowledge, I call that stumbling because we tried a lot of things that didn't work in the first few years of Dad Awesome. It's been four and a half years since we launched. Um, and I'm going to give thanks for a bunch of things in a moment. But I, I just thought if we could just pause and all think of something we're thankful for, something from our dad that we're like, I'm really thankful for that. Something from our, hev like, our Heavenly Father, like, man, I'm, I can sit here today and be really thankful for that. Like, uh, in my family, this miracle happened. And I can be really thankful for that. I think if we start with gratitude tonight, um, personally, then we'll move into gratitude as a minute. The celebration is the next phase we're going to talk about. But I asked my buddy Luke if he could play a song, a worship song. Some of you guys know the words of this song, so we'll, some of us will sing along. But we're not going to stand. It's just a moment of gratitude and of like, God, you've been faithful. You've for sure been faithful. And uh, I think that as that is the launch pad, instead of me getting into like, look what all God's done, specifics of the ministry, let's actually like pause and say we serve a really good God and he's taking us in a really good direction. So Luke, thanks for uh, leading us out. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days, I've been held in. Every breath. 
as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God all my life and all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so Heavenly Father, thank you that we can sing, but thank you that we can also live lives that are a song that show our kids of your great love. So God, help our lives to sing more than they did yesterday um, because of your love and because of a deposit that you want to do in our lives tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke, thank you. Um, Part two, part two, yes. So we've been through the fumbling phase. Let's move into foundation. So celebration, celebration. We're going to talk a little bit about, look what God has done. We've sang about God's goodness, his faithfulness. Uh, I'm going to hit these pretty fast. Some of you guys, you've been a part of these miracles. You've been a part of this story. So it's just like a, a quick little like, I'm going to point them out and then we're going to move on. Point out the ways God's been, excuse me, God's been good. So it started with the podcast. The podcast is something that I personally, by interviewing um, imperfect dads who are going after it, it's just this deposit into me. It's just like, I, it's just deposit into me week after week. And I've prayed the same thing for the guys who listen, that they would love being a dad more because they listen. They'd be spurred on, just nudged to like, oh, 
I can add a little bit of intentionality here. Oh, God loves me more than I thought he did because I heard something from a story. Oh, here's a tool. That's been the prayer about 130,000 uh, times someone's downloaded an episode of the podcast. And uh, that's more than my friends. It's gone beyond my friend circle. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we've averaged three, 4,000 the last six months a month. But this month, 6,800 people have downloaded the podcast and the month's not over yet. And it's like, God, there's nothing strategic. This is the month I do nothing strategic for the podcast because I got the ride, the fatherless of the fatherless ride. It is the month I do nothing in uh, 6,800. And uh, my Faith Radio, who runs all the KTIS stuff and Focus on the Family, there's organizations asking, can we talk about like helping the podcast go further? Like that's all stirring up. So I'm just going to stay thankful. Stay thankful. Not trying to build a platform, trying to help dads experience the love of father and that's it. <laughs> so the podcast. So look what God did there. Um, groups. We've had groups. We've had online groups. We've had personal groups. We've had uh, groups around campfires. We've had groups around the country that are RV. We've gathered groups. We've had groups of dads. Groups is a part of what we do. Um, it's a very underdeveloped part of what we do, but over 100, yeah, well over 100, over, close to 200 have been a part of a dad awesome group with some level of consistency. And uh, so I'm thankful for those groups. Uh, we studied lots of different things. Uh, grateful for the groups. Challenges. We've, we've realized that a dad invited into a forever, join us in this thing forever. We'll almost always say no, but if you say 10 days leading up to Mother's Day, join us for the dad awesome challenge or the mom awesome challenge. We're going to give you practical ways to pursue the heart of your wife for 10 days. Those kind of things they say yes to. Uh, when you say, hey, 60 days, let's do the dad awesome Murph workout. We're going to work out with the weight of our kids on our shoulders, strap a baby to our chest, do pull-ups. Um, where's Pate at? So I did one set of pull-ups with my baby. He did all of them with his baby straps on. Uh, so let's be, but like people signed up, like people come out for a challenge. So we've done challenges. We did the uh, Proverbs challenge in July a few years ago, every day, a proverb, a dad principle. So we've done challenges. We've done text messaging. A lot of text messages have been sent out. Um, it's currently at, on hiatus slash about to be relaunched, but a couple years of text messages out to hundreds of dads daily saying, here's something that God this is what God thinks about you, or here's an idea to do with your kids, or here's this. Um, so that's been a tool. And these, a lot of these are just like, look what God's done. He's done things. He's stirred up stuff. We know about some of the things. We, know, we don't know about other things. One of the things a lot of you know about is fathers for the fatherless. We thought dad awesome. Uh, we could engage and, and spur on dads to be dad awesome with resources. What we realized is only this many dads care to be a more intentional dad. I, I take that back. I think they care will step into receiving and engaging with resources with other men around intentional fatherhood because there's all kinds of reasons that would hold someone back. But when we launched Fathers for the Fatherless, which was an idea I believe dropped from heaven, it was an idea that kind of jumped into my heart, it took shape fast, 27 dads said yes the first year, 64 the second, 250 the third, roughly 280 this year. Dads, so over 600 men, I mean some of them multiple times, but like have said yes to a mission that requires 10 to 12 weeks of training and uh, requires brotherhood because they're forced on a team, requires a physical sacrifice, time sacrifice, um, fundraising sacrifice because they're saying, I care about fatherlessness, will you join me? And uh, that, that ministry has been an example of, look what God did, and there's no way I would be doing this full time if it wasn't for what God did through Fathers for the Fatherless. That was the vehicle that was like, oh, there's something stirring up and people around the country want to know more and want to launch events. That is what propelled God moving me into this full time. So I'm very grateful and I'm just curious because I feel like we're seeing this much of what God wants to do through fathers for the fatherless. Um, fra um, God did drop a framework that I'm going to talk about later, but it's something that I'm celebrating. He gave me the idea of the life framework, adding life to the dad life. I'll explain it uh, just a moment later. Uh, well, I'll explain it in five minutes from now. <laughs> um, the RV tour. God brought us an RV and said, do this 23-day tour, do this 169-day tour, hit the road a week from tomorrow and do a nine month tour. That's something that God's been up to. I'll talk about it a little more later, but it's like, I celebrate what God has done and is up to there. Uh, finances as a ministry, two years of going full time and uh, the Zog family are well fed. <laughs> um, no, God has provided above and beyond what our heart, like what our hopes and prayers were. I laid out a business plan hoping for this and he's exceeded it in the first two years. So we're just massively thankful. I'd say, look what God has done in that area. Um, roughly, as a, at a high level, our budget is a third of our, our revenue as a ministry is enterprising revenue, which means there's earned income streams, there's tools, registration revenue, sponsors. People pay for something of value that fuels that third of the budget. Very grateful. 
A third of the budget has been organizational supported. So churches or ministries have said, we care about what you're doing. We want to write big checks to help you do what you do. Um, and then a third is um, personal, friends, family, um, fundraising. <laughs> that we've never done any fundraising until. Tonight technically has it in the name of the night. It's not a fundraiser, but it, like tonight's the first time we've even mentioned that word in two years. So look what God's done. Like two years and it's all come in without asking. And many of you around the circle are answers to prayer because God told you to sow into this ministry and it shocked Michelle and I when we heard about it. Like that's how, that's how the first two years have been funded is God told people and it got funded. Um, and we said, look what God has done. Because often you guys don't know when you make a gift financially to the ministry, you don't know how like the timing is so strategic. They haven't been desperation moments. It hasn't been that kind of, but like strategic moments of, oh, wow, <laughs> there was a need. And look what we can do now because of it. So, and then the last area of look what God has done is stories, which tonight I wish I could be like, let's go eight stories in a row. I'm going to share a couple of the stories tonight. Um, there are stories of marriages being saved. There are stories of um, dads seeing a counselor and like, like massive freedom happening. There are stories of churches who are amped and on fire and different, like crazy. Like there's stories um, of men being reconnected with their dads because of healing work that God did through Fathers to the Fatherless. And Sean, I was hoping you could hop up here and join me for one of these stories. Um, because I cried my way through the story when I was biking with this guy. He's sharing his story with me. And Sean, I was just like, if I can hear your story one more time, you, God will wreck me again. So thanks, buddy. You mind clipping that on? Um, uh, will you guys welcome Sean? Thanks. Yeah, so we, I just love to hear, we would love to hear, um, you did a bike ride called Fathers for the Fatherless. Yeah. What did that stir up that led to a um, uh, bigger impact than just um, a bike ride? Well, Fathers for the Fatherless has been a crazy impact and meaningful thing in my life for the past three years. Um, you know, I came across uh, Fathers for the Fatherless by accident. I was training for a marathon, blew out my calf, and I remember seeing a video at Substance of these crazy guys riding 100 miles, right? And, uh, and, and it's crazy how God works and, and got me to the ride. But I personally grew up without a father, right? Um, my parents were never married. Uh, I grew up with my mom, single mom. And as a child, you know, you have that, that emptiness, that, that feeling of rejection, um, that you're not worthy of love, and all those things spill into the other areas of your life, right? And, uh, and looking back, you know, it wasn't clear then, but, you know, I was unwilling to accept our Heavenly Father's love because I didn't even understand, you know, the earthly example, right, uh, wasn't there. And it became, you know, a lot of the times when you listen to Jeff speak about the statistics involved with fatherlessness, you know, I fell into all those categories, right? Um, you know, as far as substance abuse and uh, like terrible attendance at school and um, getting in trouble quite a bit, right? Um, and you know, by 13, uh, you know, I was I was an active alcoholic by by age 13, you know, and that lasted um, quite a while, uh, you know, and and it got to the point, um, you know towards the end there where I, I had a son and I became a father myself, right? I didn't know how to be a dad, right? And, uh, and in my dysfunctional life, you know, I became a single dad and that was even scarier, right? Like, I don't know what to do now. Um, and there was just kind of all, uh, all these crazy things and, and it finally got bad enough and, and father, fatherhood has played this amazing role in my life and, and it's crazy how God has used it in all these different areas, however, you know, it took being a father, being a single father to a son, and the thought of losing my son, because I had, you know, God used the state of Minnesota to convince me to do something about my life, let's be honest. <laughs> and uh, and um, the thought of losing my son is what made me get my life back together. And then I found church, and I found a relationship with Jesus, and that's when things came together, and that's what brought me to um, Fathers for the Fatherless, and I was able to, to participate. And you know, that first year, I've done it for three years, that first year that I participated in Fathers for the Fatherless, um, you know, there was something that was crazy that was happening to my heart. It really, it really softened my heart quite a bit, um, and I, I decided that I was going to reach out to my father, right? He had made attempts previously in my mid-20s, and I just wasn't ready, right? And I was still stuck in my sickness. My heart wasn't there, right? And... Um, you know, I started seeing things differently, I started hearing things differently, and I heard a message, and it was, um, it was uh, actually a Father's Day message from Steve, Stephen Furtick. 
And he was talking about, um, you know, uh, Jacob on his deathbed talking to Joseph and, and saying, you know, I, I didn't know where you were for 20-something years, and now I'm here with your grandchildren. I know your grandchildren. And I thought about that, and I was like, wow, you know, that, that could be my story, right? That could be a part of my story, right? Like, and that spirit of forgiveness just kind of overcame me, and I, I reached out to my father, you know, and, um, and I was able to pursue a relationship with my dad. And uh, now that, that's pretty cool, but, but like to see how that has played out in my life is pretty amazing, right? Um, it started off with a conversation, then it went to FaceTimes. And by the second Fathers for the Fatherless slide ride, uh, right before that um, ride, I got to go out and meet him in person for the first time. Um, I was telling a few of you earlier uh, about my daughter. She's a year and a half old right now. And the first six months, man, was it rough. Like, it was just nuts. Like, it was a nightmare. But at the same time, she got to meet my father for the first time. And the first time she ever laughed was with my dad. It was my first time ever meeting him. Yeah. And the first time I, my daughter ever laughed. It was like, it was amazing. I started bawling my eyes out on the spot, right? Like, what do you even do with that? And then I'm looking up like, man, you got a sense of humor, that's for sure. <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, and then, and then it progressed. And um, this past year, I was, I was able to, um, to go out and spend time with him. I stayed at his house. I met my siblings for the first time. I met the rest of my family. I, saw, I met aunts and uncles for the first time. And it was truly amazing. And, and there are a couple areas that are really important to me. I mean, um, you know, I, I just bought my first house um, a, a couple months ago. And my father was a part of that. My father is the one who reached out and was like, you know what, I want this for your family. Can I help you? I never started this relationship to get anything out of it, right? Like, I started it as a, par as a process of healing right, that, so that I could be at peace and that I wouldn't, you know, hurt the same way that I hurt before. Um, but then things like that happen and you're just like, oh my gosh, you know, like what in the world? Um, so that's pretty amazing, but that's, that's the earthly stuff, right? Um, the stuff that really, really touches my heart and the amazing miracle of God, like, never wasting pain, right? Like God always has this amazingly creative way of using your pain for purpose, right? And I think about myself as a father and me being able to reach out to him as a, you know, as a father myself, I get to be an example to my son, right? One of the things that I left out is, you know, the reason why I was a single dad was because my son's biological mother uh, struggles with addiction as well, right? My son hasn't seen his biological mom in like four and a half years now, right? Um, but because he has that absence of a parent, right? I have that experience. I can connect to my son on a level that I never would have been able to unless I went through that myself. So when he goes through those, those struggles and he asks about his biological mom and he feels that missing link, I know what that feels like and I can connect with him on a different level, right? And I never would have had that unless God allowed me to experience and endure that pain myself, right? So in the end, it came full circle, right? And then the other thing is we still pray for his biological mom all the time. And what ground would I have to stand on if one day she healed and she came back into his life and I told him to forgive him? I had to be that example and I had to reach out to my own father and be the example of forgiveness, right? I had to forgive first. And that way, when the miracle happened, I can be there to say, hey, I know it's really hard, but, you know, I did it and I'm going to help you through it. So this ministry has really, really been this incredibly impactful thing, you know. I went through a crazy job transition last year as well, and um, the job I'm at right now is because of a, a guy on this ride, right? I had to, to pass some crazy exams to get the job that I have right now. And you know who was texting me in the morning, on the morning of my exams? Guys from this ride that were like, we're praying for you. We want you to pass this. I know you're stressed, but you got this. God has got you, you know? So everything that, you know, I just want to thank you, Jeff, because this ministry has just poured into my family, um, you know, and quite honestly, generations, right? Like my son is going to have a different example because of the impact this ride and this ministry has had on me. Wow. Wow. Thanks for your testimony. Yeah. Let's thanks, Sean. Love you, brother. Love, Love you. you, too. So Sean's story, when he was willing 
to share with the team a couple years ago about riding for the fatherless, but like he is fatherless and the courage to take a step. Like that is infectious. It infects a team and the team goes a whole lot deeper. The brotherhood goes a whole lot higher and lives are changed. And so like these are the types of conversations that happen while we're pedaling bikes in spandex. <laughs> um, one of my biggest prayers, one of my biggest prayers is that a generation, like hundreds of thousands someday, men will have been a part of a Fathers for the Fatherless event and in doing so realize I'm the one who has experienced layers and types of fatherlessness and God wants to heal that so I don't pass it on. Like it's, that, is, that is to me like the, uh, that is the secret sauce that we're just seeing little, little glimpses of. But it's, and it's also God's heart for the fatherless. We raise money and support, but like we all, God wants to father us in those areas. So um, I could go on and on with more stories. And Sean, thank you again. Uh, I'm going to move us into vision though. Vision for the, uh, the next few years. I call this the framing phase. And a little bit like the last section, I'm going to just point out some things. And it's going to uh, hopefully make you as excited as it makes me. But I can't flesh out the whole, like this is exactly what this thing is. It's just like God's got us chasing this. We're, we're headed that way, and it's, it's based on, it's informed by the foundation phase of, and, and the fumbling phase that I talked about. So here's where we're going. Um, in a month, I'm gathering with leaders of fatherhood ministries from across the country. Mark Batterson and I are co-hosting an event, a 24-hour event called the Dad Awesome Summit. Leaders are flying themselves in to spend 24 hours together, and these are, these are um, I am the like infant, infant baby of, compared to the ministry years and decades these guys have led ministries, but yet because of a podcast, I know these people and I've invited them to come. I'm the convener and I booked the hot air balloon that we're gonna go up in together. <laughs> um, it's the first Dad Awesome Summit. We're gonna do the next one the following year. It's gonna be more like a three day, two nights, 25 leaders. But we believe that to bring the state of like intentional fatherhood resources to the church and to bring um, some movement in the direction of a generation of dads helping with fatherlessness, it's gonna take hundreds of organizations. And Dad Awesome just happens to be we're gifted the opportunity to be a convener. So that's what we're doing in a, in a month in Colorado. Um, the, uh, the website, the brand, the, 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 the look feel of Dad Awesome is four and a half years old. So one thing we're stepping into is a bit of a brand refresh, bringing a new website. It's a project that's not as fun to talk about as these other things, but I've been praying for it for a while and praying for funding for it. So, uh, so we're hoping to step into that project this winter. Um, the podcast, I call it stewardship. We're just stewarding what God's given us and we're trusting him for his time to grow it. And I shared earlier, like he's, he is growing it. Uh, the relaunch of the Dad Awesome Nudge, this Dad Awesome Daily text message. It's something I believe for. I believe it's helpful because dads are busy and a little text message is not disruptive, but it's a nudge and a deposit. I just haven't, uh, I, like it's like ready, set, not yet. So the RV life is going to be the, the season of launching the, uh, the nudge, the Dad Awesome Nudge. Um, or maybe we may call it Dad Awesome Daily again. Um, one thing I'm excited to tell you guys about, you're the first group that I'm telling about this, is, uh, and I, I say this with reluctance and with great passion, I'm writing the first Dad Awesome book. And it's super scary. <laughs> but God has brought upwards of 20 independent people who have come without any like, should I write or should I not write a book? I never mentioned it. Four and a half years of the ministry. And God has sent me, close to 20 people who have said, I think God wants you to write, put this in book form. And so I am writing the first Dad Awesome book. I'm 13 bad chapters into a 40 chapter Dad Awesome book. It's written for the non-reader. It's written for the non-reader. You can pick it up and read any chapter you want. Uh, and it's, it's written to a dad who likely didn't pay for the book because dads aren't readers. Likely a church paid for it, a wife paid for it, or a grandparent paid for it, or a friend paid for this book and put it in the hands. And within 10 seconds, can we convince this dad to give it a shot and to just be curious about the pathway of becoming dad awesome. And here's how, just real quick, uh, it's the adding life to the dad life. The life framework is something God gave after hundreds of episodes of the podcast, about 100 episodes of the podcast. I was like, is there some sense of a, a framework that helps us grow in different areas? So life. Here it is quick. I am loved as the L. The first part of being dad awesome is loved by God, being a son of God. I am loved. I am intentional is the second part of the framework. Intentionality, time, energy, focus, passion, pursuit. Um, uh, I, am I am loved. I am intentional. I am free is freedom work. 
it's the kind of work that you're talking about, of forgiving. And re, like, it's like God wants to do freedom work in us dads. I've talked about that a little bit already tonight. And then the E is I enjoy my kids. Pleasure, delight, enjoyment. I love being a dad. I love that I get to be a dad. So it's wrapped in what God spoke over Jesus. You are my son whom I love. God spoke this over Jesus when he was baptized. He speaks it over us as adopted sons. In you I am well pleased. Pleasure, unconditional. So that's what it's wrapped in. But the Dad Awesome framework is the first Dad Awesome book. Ten chapters, each of those micro, two to three page chapters. Uh, every chapter has podcast like backing. It's not just my voice. It's this person said this um, that comes behind. And it's a tool, it's a field guide. And I'm praying that it's helpful. And I'm really insecure about writing it, so pray for me. <laughs> um, okay, so now you know. You're the only ones that know uh, that the, the Dad Awesome book is being written. Um, the Fathers for the Fatherless expansion we believe that year five of Fathers for the Fatherless is the year that it's going to, I don't know if it will blow up numbers wise, but it is the year of saying to the Twin Cities and saying to the other cities we're in, um, we've been around for a while, we're here to stay, and look what God has done through this ministry, and look what he's up to. And man, there are some churches in the city doing some pretty amazing things. I'm going to point these guys out. Dave and Eli, can you guys wave quick so they know who you were talking to? So, so these guys, a church in St. Michael's has three years in a row, um, taken over. The men of their church are so deeply passionate about this mission. The church, not just the men, like this church is forever changed because they've said we're all in. We own this mission. We're going to do it forever. And the city is taking notice. The families, the, the kids, the kids' friends are taking notice that these men have said we care about fatherlessness and we're going to do something hard year over year. And my prayer on year five of Fathers for the Fatherless, thank you for your leadership in that, by the way. You guys, if we if God would just give me five more churches a year like what you guys are doing, we'd change the world. We would. Like, you guys have owned it, and God has done humongous things. Year five for us, though, is going to be more than cycling. So we have done cycling events for four years, but we're stepping into Spartan Obstacle Course Races. Spartan Obstacle Course Races. We're stepping into golf events, 100 holes of golf in a day. We're stepping into triathlons. We're stepping into um, a running event, which we did one of those in the past. We're doing it again. And we're taking the bike ride public. So the Fathers for the Fatherless bike ride, hundreds of men are going to join the Tour de Tonka first Saturday in, uh, in August, a 3,000 person event. We're gonna show up with three to 400 men and we're going to raise 400 to $500,000 in one day. They celebrate about twenty dollars to $30,000 in charitable giving their bike ride with 3,000 participants. And we're gonna show up and we're gonna share the mission with thousands and thousands of cyclists in the city, and it's gonna be our year of taking this mission public. Um, you're the first to know about that as well. Um, it's, we've been praying about it for a while, but this is our year of going public with the mission, and we're not running our own event. They run the event. We show up with teams of cyclists. It's still all the same um, teams of men after the mission, doing a hard thing, riding 100 miles, but we're doing it in and amongst thousands of people who do not know about this mission, and uh, their lives will be changed when they hear about it. So that's a big change. And then the last thing uh, for the vision for the next few years, the framing phase, is uh, we're about to set off on a nine-month road trip. A nine-month RV road trip with the four little Zog girls and my courageous wife, Michelle. <laughs> and uh, it's not untested. We did a 10-day trip. We did a 23-day trip. We did a 169-day trip. And now, somehow, I, and I've said this, this is an obedience trip. It's not an adventure trip. We can't wait to get out there and travel again. It's an obedience trip. God has aligned miracle after miracle and shown us last year all of these stories of his faithfulness, and he's invited us in. We've been in, like, this is a faithfulness trip. We don't have to travel. I could fly out to a couple bike rides. Last year, we felt like, man, we kind of, we have these five events. We got to live in an RV and get to, like, it doesn't feel that way. I have teams that can run these events without me. It feels like God is saying, go again, but go longer. So we're going to go a month in Colorado, a month in San Diego, a couple weeks in Arizona, a couple weeks in Dallas, Texas three months in Florida, and then in the Carolinas, Atlanta for a month, and back. We're longer stays so I can write the book. We're going to stay a month in each place, and we're going deeper. These are friends. These are partners, and, uh, and that, is, that actually leads us into the future phase, but I, uh, I'll hold on that for now. We are, that is the last uh, framing phase update. Can I move into, actually, before I move in, Luke, come on up here. Luke, who led us in worship a moment ago. Yeah, leave the guitar this time. <laughs> Strap that on for a moment. We'll, we'll go brief because uh, I'm a little behind schedule in our agenda, but I love this. Are you guys okay so far? You guys all right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so Luke runs a program called the Good Father Program at, uh, 
at Pregnancy Choices, a crisis pregnancy center. And when I heard about what he does, my prayer is that we would be adding life to the dad life. We'd help a, a team of men, a generation of men, add life to the dad life. And what Luke does is he helps dads at a critical point of, do we keep the baby, do we not keep the baby? We decided to keep the baby, we need help. It's the early infant stage of dad life. He helps these dads um, not only choose life, so we say adding life to the dad life, Luke helps dads choose life and choose the dad life versus walking and leaving that child fatherless. We can stop there and just applaud and be thankful for what you do. Um, um, it's remarkable what you do, and we get a chance with Fathers for the Fatherless to hire a life coach that speaks Spanish to do life coaching for this program. It's like, we get to do this. Like, it's like, what? We get to give money for a, pro a program like that? Like, thank you. Um, thank you. I'd love to, to share a moment. How is the bike ride? How is the money? How, like, what do you use this for, and how is it changing lives? First of all, thanks for the shirt. Yeah. <laughs> the shirt. <laughs> um, what a gift. So for years, so we started the program about seven years ago. And um, uh, one of the goals early on in the year, or early on in that process, kind of like someday, we'll have a, a guy, a life coach, at the Life Center five days a week. And then someday we'll hire a Spanish-speaking coach. And just the way that the Lord would work, this year I felt called into this work full time. So I'm there four days a week. We got another guy covering the fifth day. And then I met Jeff, who said, what do you need? And we said, we're, we're looking for a Spanish-speaking life coach to coach dads. And he's like, I can do that. So you're like, well, God still has to be yeah. the right person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can fund it. Oh, uh, yeah, it. we can fund it. But that's a big obstacle, like you know. Yeah. And uh, actually, when you talk to God, when you talk about God, obstacle. the obstacles, it's really nothing. I mean, it's just amazing. But um, it's meant the world to kind of um, find you, to meet you. I also have four daughters. <laughs> and when I had first found the podcast, that awesome. Uh, and I was just like listening, and I'm like, you know what? I just need to be more intentional as a father. I turn on the podcast, the first podcast I hear, the first episode, and I picked at random. Jeff gets on there, he's like, you just got to be a more intentional man. I'm turning 40. In your 40s, you start, you know, kind of like getting a little soft. So he's like, I'm going to do 40 things that are super intentional in my life for my family. The intentional 40. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and that was the first one. He's like, I got four girls. I'm like, where is this guy coming from? Like, so it's really, again, I'm inspired by your work in every way. We're so grateful for the partnership in every way. Well, this is an example, though, of alignment, of God bringing into yeah. alignment. We're not going to run and hire and train. I mean, this life coaching, this is not just like a easy, like this is an intense program. Dads hold up a written plaque of this is my intentional fatherhood mission statement. They write it and frame it and put it on the wall. Like these dads are like, if I could have had that when I became a dad, like, this is good for everyone, but these dads who have chosen life, chosen the dad life, thank you for your work. And there's a lot more that we're going to get to do together. So thanks for just featuring a little bit of it. Um, okay, we're going to dive forward into... Oh, yeah, let's celebrate. <laughs> uh, thankful for you, Luke. Um, this is the shortest one yet. The vision for a few decades. So you heard vi vision for a few years, vision for a few decades. I call it the future phase. And I could, I could see giving the rest of my life to this mission. Like, this is... if. God has like so stoked up a passion and a gratefulness that I get to do this, that I see this as like, I'm already envisioning forward to my girls all get married. And actually that's my secret agenda is that I could just somehow see, maybe it's not me, but maybe it's one of the other organizations, just a generation of dads who raise up some sons who are free from the pass down of pain, who love Jesus, know how much their heavenly father loves them, have a dad who took them through a process of, of becoming a man, of, of knowing that they are treasured beyond what anything they do. It's unconditional love. If these boys, maybe in some tiny way, the work of Dad Awesome would, would inspire those dads of those boys, um, then it's all like, if it impacts nobody else, praise God. <laughs> so, so I have a very um, uh, conflict of interest of my own personal <laughs> go after these boys. Um, um, so I had something that was going to lead to, but I lost it. Um, oh, I could see some of these men being on staff and leading this ministry in the future. My daughters, like, I see the ministry way, way forward. So when I say vision for a few decades, the future phase, give the rest of my life to this. I could see thousands of churches being dad-awesome churches that when you arrive at that church, you check your kids in the first time, you know 
that you can't help but understand because of what's on the walls and what's given to you and the way they speak and the men inviting you in. This church cares about fatherhood. This church is not going to leave this area untouched, which is the norm. I know hundreds and hundreds of kids pastors, youth pastors, missions pastors, men's, men's leaders. Churches are not doing fatherhood ministry. It is the norm. So if the norm is thousands of churches are dad awesome churches, um, raising up and welcoming the new dad who just, who j- they just, they're pregnant. They don't have the baby yet. They're, a party's being thrown for that dad and a pathway to being dad awesome for their kids. So I, that's what I see that in the long term. It's thousands of churches resourcing the pathway of being dad awesome. Cities. I see cities being in awe of the local church and how beautiful it is. The local church, the bride of Christ, that church is amazing. I have no idea what they preach there. That church is amazing because the men of that church, they care about fatherlessness. And man, the men of that church are intentional dads. We see it on the soccer fields. We see it at the playgrounds. Like, I know that that church is somehow connected to fathers for the fatherless. And there's events all year round now because they're all types of fathers. Like, like those churches, there is something going on because, man, our city has changed because of the men who have stepped up and said, I care about intentional fatherhood and helping the fatherless. So that's the kind of small vision that I have for the ministry. Um, it's going to happen. It's totally going to happen. And we get to be a part of it. What a gift. Um, there's two questions that I've been asked. One is, why are you traveling as a family in the RV? And how can we help support this mission? So I'll just quickly give you the answers. We're traveling in the RV because God told us to. Last year we saw dad awesome meetups in garages and skate parks and other places like men gathering and they answer resounding this is the first time someone's invited me to a circle to talk about intentional fatherhood. So we gather them. I, I travel and interview guests. I got really sick of Zoom interviews over those couple of years. So I just like want to be in person as much as possible. So I'm interviewing guests as we travel. I don't have to travel in an RV to, for podcast interviews, but man, I love it. Um, I meet with partner churches, partner ministries. So these, there's amazing ministries doing work in men, area of men, missions. And I get to meet with them and park my RV in their driveways. <laughs> and they get to know my four daughters and my wife. And like the, the, it's very rich, the time we get to spend with some of these people. And then um, we, uh, I'm going to write the book as we travel. And we're going to do some Fathers for the Fatherless events as we travel. There's a running event in Atlanta. There's a, there's a Spartan event in Florida that we're doing. And, uh, and there's a couple other bike rides. And um, yeah, so that's why we're traveling. That's, that's why it makes sense to sacrifice and live in this enclosed space with four little girls, is there are tangible things that we've seen God move. And, and it is an accelerator, but in a long play way. I would stay in Minnesota if we wanted to grow this thing fast. Because being here, there's a lot of momentum right now in Minnesota. Traveling feels like the slow play, but the seeding, the movement that God, like it really feels like God wants us to do the slow play and keep enriching these relationships. And, and I'm learning so much. It's affecting how I father and how I lead this ministry. So that's why we're traveling. How can you support the mission? Michelle, will you join me for this part? <laughs> um, would you guys welcome my wife, Michelle? Um, so the first way that you guys can support the mission is to pray for us. It's, it's, it's to pray for us. Would you clip that on your jean jacket there? Um, uh, it is the most important way. Uh, it is the most important thing is prayer. Uh, would you just share a little bit about why at the prayer team? Yeah, I feel like I... I like don't care about the funding. I don't. I mean, I feel like if we have a prayer team, like yep. God will provide. Yep. And I feel like it's just been. We started a prayer team about two years ago, um, maybe a little longer, um, and just have seen such an impact. Like, we'll send an, a a prayer team email, and like the atmosphere will change in our RV, like with our family, and just seeing like things that were like a little hard, and then all of a sudden like we'll have breakthrough, like finding a place to stay that we were stressed about, or I was stressed, Jeff doesn't get stressed very often, but um, you know, like, fi- like finding, it just says over and over, we have seen God just show up. And so I feel like the prayer team is for sure the most, the most important. And um, we just over and over seeing like, I just was reading Ephesians 3 and just like, um, just, doing more than we can ask or think. I feel like God has brought answers to prayer we didn't even know we were praying. And just even a couple examples, 
like we were um, we were a little dry, feeling a little dry, like as we had gone from um, we went straight down to Arizona and then out to San Diego. We were feeling dry, and I f- just praying about like church and our kids, like you know. I don't know. They just sometimes their age. They just don't love kids ministry in a new place. And so we're praying about that. And we walk into the Jesus Culture Church in San Diego. And the girl who checked our daughter's name is Rhea, our three year old. And the girl who's checking us in, her name is Rhea. That's not a common name. And so like she checks us in, and Rhea's like, oh, someone with my name. And they like go in and have the best time. And I was like, oh. And the service was just like felt so. It just was such a gift. And then we, when we were in Dallas, we didn't know where we were going to stay at another RV pick, park picked out. And we found out from a friend of a friend that this guy, Chuck, had a horse pasture that he has RV hookups in. So we're like, okay, we'll stay in Chuck's horse pasture. <laughs> and <laughs> ended up getting to stay there almost two weeks. And, um, and God totally knew that we needed to be there. He's a super prayerful man and um, has become like a mentor, like, prayer partner like Jeff prays with him once a week now and has continued to journey with us and he um Jeff flew home for just a quick like appointment for one of our daughters and ended up Dallas had a snowstorm and I was with the three little girls in the RV in a snowstorm without all the things that you have when you're in Minnesota in a snowstorm Jeff had four canceled flights and couldn't get home so it was going to be a two-day trip turned into a five-day trip and I feel like God knew that I needed to be in Chuck's horse pasture because you know and just seeing his hand of protection and then we one other story is we were we were not sure what to do around Christmas we were like we can't meet with churches like where should we go for Christmas we went down to South Padre Island like way down in the way Um, and we went there just kind of doing like, oh, we'll go to somewhere warm for vacation, then we'll leave again. And, um, we met this family that had four kids that our kids just jived. We connected with the, with the parents. We ended up meeting with them four times on the rest of our trip as they were going over to Florida. We were, they were praying for friends and they didn't have any RV friends that they'd met. And so like they were to answer to their prayer. We happened to be on the same street at this huge RV park. We were on the same street and overlapped for like three days and happened to like just have this connection. It was so, so God. And yeah, and so. There are dozens. We filled a whole poster board after we just with one month of words that described so our girls knew like these are marker moments. It was like remembrance of like, look what God did here and here and here and here. And they usually coincide in waves with when we send a prayer team email out. It's once a month we send an email and usually that's when the swell of answered prayers and God moments is after we send our prayer email. Uh, so prayer is massive. It's an email, and then we are using a new tool, a Marco Polo, kind of one directional where we can post prayer emails or prayer video updates. Like we're trying to do that almost once a week, but it's a little short, a couple minutes. And then you can, we're trying to amp up the amount that we pray back for our prayer team. So we're committed to pray for our prayer team. And that actually has brought already some really beautiful, like, so we're inviting you guys. And some of you might know someone who is like your aunt, who cares deeply about fatherhood ministry and, and the helping the fatherless and is a prayer warrior. So if you could recruit someone that we don't even know to pray, that would be a massive gift. We'd love to have you as well pray for us. But uh, we're, we're just praying to build that team even stronger this year and to share those miracles with you guys. So anything else to add? Or is that, is that good? Okay. So that's the number one way. I'll let you unclip that. And then Jeff Carver, oh, we'll do a tag team. You guys can give a high five on the way out. So as Jeff comes, uh, so Jeff Carver Uh, leads up the National Christian Foundation, the local chapter here. Um, And strategically, he has invested more in me as a leader, as a follower of Jesus who uses business skills and entrepreneurial skills to create things that serve the church. We logged nine years on the same team before I became a pastor. He was my boss. And he's actually going to therapy because of having to deal with me for nine years. Um, um, So I have deep respect for Jeff and uh, I would not have started this ministry. Like there's no doubt, uh, but not only like teach me to write a business plan and create a vision and chase after and launch and uh, talk people into following me. Um, But secondly, it would just be like, he took me to breakfast during a short sabbatical before when I stopped being a pastor, started going full-time in the ministry. I said, I'm not going to do no forward advancement for seven weeks, 40 days prayer. He took me to breakfast and he said, there's no fundraising especially like I was not at all thinking Jeff for fundraising and he's like we're in for two years of commitment every month we're going to give to your ministry and like that meant a like that meant a lot so I want to say thank you 
And uh, I asked him just to share a little bit about strategically how he sees strategic giving because that's what he does professionally and why, why he said yes to giving to Dad Awesome. Yeah. Well, nobody talks anybody into following Jeff Zog. And I don't know if you noticed he does the... <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, I did have the pleasure of working with Jeff and he, he likes to say I was his boss, but ultimately I probably learned more from you and with you than, than you did for me. We had a lot of fun and uh, we saw, saw and experienced some incredible things and, and served churches in some extraordinary ways. So at the, at the National Christian Foundation, we get to work with you know, five, 600 families across the Twin Cities, uh, serving them as, as it relates to their giving. And I see all sorts of uh, different approaches in ways that people think about where to give and how to give and how much to give. And even in the context of a marriage, and as I look at my marriage with my wife, Cammie, and we even see things a little bit differently. Uh, but we get together every year uh, and kind of set out a plan, but then we also get together monthly and kind of look at uh, different opportunities and just bring things spur of the moment. For me, one of the things I love to do is invest in innovation. So when we look to give, some people like to invest in the proven model. I love to invest in startups uh, for a couple reasons. Number one, I think they can have extraordinary leverage if it's the right startup, that, that a small investment can make, uh, can make an exponentially larger impact uh, if it's invested well. And then I love to invest in leaders and in the development of leaders because even if one venture goes uh, a different direction than you anticipate, if it's the right leader, uh, God's gonna do something through them over time. And so we came around Jeff very early in the process um, with kind of those two things in mind. And then I think that the, the third thing is this. Um, over the last five years in my role, my, my vocational role, I probably met with, let's just call it 500 ministries and organizations across the Twin Cities, across Minnesota, and really across the country. And there's so much brokenness in our world. I mean, can we all just acknowledge it's everywhere? We see it in the city, we see it out in the country, we see it in the suburbs. Sometimes it's more hidden, sometimes it's more obvious, whether it's addiction, uh, whether it's uh, um, educational gaps or wealth gaps, or it's depression, or it's cutting, or it's suicide, or it's uh, uh, people in the criminal justice system. Whatever it is, we just see so much brokenness in the world. And there's so many organizations working to address many of those issues and come alongside of people and children and parents and families. But I, I think as I look kind of upstream from those issues, where does a lot of this start? A lot of it starts with fatherlessness. And, uh, and when, when kids grow up without a dad, actively engaged, intentional, and loving them, it doesn't mean that uh, a, a single parent family can't thrive or a single mom uh, can't, but it's hard, right? I mean, they, they've got to work three times as hard to make it work. And when, uh, when dads are engaged, it makes a difference. And I'm convinced that it makes a difference downstream. And so yeah. those are the reasons that uh, we really chose to invest in Jeff. The fun thing now for all of us here is it's no longer a startup. Like they're growing and hearing the stories of, of uh, potential growth through Faith Radio, uh, through Focus on the Family, and some of these other networks, like it's starting to catch, right? Things are happening, so what an exciting time to get on board. So Cami and I will continue to support Jeff and Michelle, Dad Awesome, and Fathers for the Fatherless uh, as we kind of head into this next season. And um, I guess on behalf of uh, the Zogs and uh, leadership team and their advisors just want to invite you all to do the same. And I'm guessing a lot of you probably already are. Um, but uh, what a fun journey uh, to be on and would love to have uh, you join that or continue on that. So there's, I think there's two ways. We just uh, talked about this earlier. There's two ways that if you're interested in making a gift uh, or supporting them, there's two ways to do that. And if you look at your cards, you can see it. Um, number one is to do it online and you can go to Dad Awesome dot org uh, slash give and uh, and make a gift online or you can write a check and uh, if you don't know dead awesome partners with uh, an organization called venture expeditions who acts as their fiscal agent so any checks can be made out to venture and just write dad awesome the matter in the memo line um, 
but maybe just just one thing to consider is as, as you all kind of pray about that tonight tomorrow in the days ahead um, is uh, is the possibility of supporting them uh, making a longer term commitment like I think a lot of times we make one time gifts to organizations, but it seems like the folks in this room, a lot of you, we're all in, right? Um, we've been a part of this, we've been exposed to this for a while. If, uh, if you consider making uh, a monthly or quarterly contribution, I just know I've run ministries and led ministries and helped others and consulted and start. When you have that commitment, it just helps so much in terms of planning and kind of, and kind of forecasting versus, for the future versus wondering is there gonna be enough money this month? How much money is there gonna be next month? And as an organization's growing, having that predictability is really helpful. So I don't think Jeff came in expecting to make an ask tonight. In fact, I know he didn't, but, but I and probably a couple other people came around and said, no, you, like these are your people. You should, you should invite them uh, to give. So if you wanna make a gift, you can tonight. Um, or if you wanna think about it and pray about it, that's great too. Um, uh, take this with you, uh, think about it, lift it up. Talk with your spouse or uh, your family and, and uh, consider making a gift to support these guys and their amazing work. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, we're going to steer into just a quick uh, question and answer time. We are at time, so I'm not going to keep you much longer. There are a couple envelopes that I did not have prepared until right before we came. My, uh, my wife, Michelle, her mom, Kathy, was like, bring some envelopes in case they brought a check. And I was like, oh, that's not the. So there are, I think, on a couple of the high top tables, if you choose to tonight, want to drop a check. And, avoid a stamp or, or you were planning on ahead of time. So um, thank you, Jeff. Grateful for you. Uh, the only thing I didn't mention is Betsy and Eric. Where's Eric sitting? He had to slip out. Oh, wonderful. So Betsy and Eric are our hosts this evening. Can you guys thank Betsy and Eric for hosting us? Um, and I, I actually misspoke when I said Jeff was the first because like six months earlier, when this was just still a crazy idea, you said, you're like, if you guys decide to make the jump, we're in off monthly. Like that, that meant a lot. That meant a lot. Like it's, it's amazing how when a friend says we're behind you and we want to, um, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I want to like say, good night, get out of here. But if there is any obvious quick question and answer, let's take two minutes. Is there one or two that I'm just like, did not hit tonight? And you're like, what about this? Rapid fire. And if there's not, that's great too. My wife's a teacher. She says, let the silence go for a well, moment. Jeff, I think the concept that a lot of us are trying to get our arms around, you're going to be driving around the country with a family of four girls, and you're going to write a book. Hmm. Does that mean that Michelle's up front driving? <laughs> this is a good question. <laughs> this is a good question. So uh i am grateful that michelle supported me going up twice to a prayer cabin this summer and that's where those chapters got written was at a prayer cabin and that is the plan is not to go to a prayer cabin while we travel but to take specific days and times whether it's from the cab of the ford flex or she's out on an adventure and i use the rv but to have slotted times to write uh that is the plan not while driving so as of now 13 feet tall tow vehicle i am the i'm the current driver she can do everything she's a rock star but the driving the rv yeah. Yeah. Or if one of you are like, hey, I'll take a shift of driving, just join us and then you can fly yourself home afterwards. <laughs> well, we're welcoming drivers if anyone wants to come drive. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great question. We've always, as a ministry, but not always, started with zero in the bank account as a ministry. We've hovered from 30K to 60K of money in the bank account. So grateful. So there's never been a get the friends together and have a fundraiser because we can't put gas in the RV to get us home. Um, we have never had that point. Um, we have some strategic opportunities. We hired a 10 hour per week admin person um, so that we have increased some of our costs. But I, as of right now, it's still very light, our ministry expenses. Uh, I came thinking, man, what if 40 or 50K came in from, it's not just this, it's about three times as many people are going to watch the video. Um, I was like, man, that would be amazing. Well, then I have to tell the story. I have to, this is worth two minutes. Okay. <laughs> so I decided this year, Fathers for the Fatherless, we've raised almost $700,000. I've been a big fundraiser. I've got a fundraising event. I've got a vision event a couple days after the ride. I'm not going to raise for the fatherless this year, personally. I thought that. I was like, I'll take a year off. I'll take a year off. I've, I'm grateful. Uh, love the mission, but I'll take a year off and use my influence to get other people to raise. Michelle tells me, she's like, what are you doing? <laughs> I 
She's like, what are you doing? So, so we have, I have a drive to Eagle River. She's like, get it going. And I was like, uh, immediately a strategy came to mind. And she's like, do it. So 10 straight days, 20 minutes a day, I used my initiative to fundraise and I documented it, shared it with the whole team. So my 20 minutes a day nets out to a whole lot more than that because people are watching what I do. I raised $1,600 in the first six or seven, that's, that's what I raised, $1,600 this year for the fatherless. Um, but I documented it. On day five of my daily, um, an organization that I met two months ago contacted me, and they had said no to the sponsorship, but I'm interested in making a gift to your organization. I did a follow-up email, crickets. Day five of this initiative, they say we just started from our foundation a $8,000 gift to your ministry. Not to the fatherless, this is to support the infrastructure, our ministry. And I'm like, knocked off my email mode, knocked off. $8,000 unexpected on day five. Day seven of my 10 day, I, um, someone I met like six weeks ago, no strategy, did not think at all was gonna make a gift. I was just like, I like this guy. Uh, he sits down with me on day seven and hands me a $12,500 check for the ministry. and says, we've been looking for, for years, someone who's doing work in these two areas and this is a gift from our family. So over 20K came in with me already thinking 40, 50, somewhere in there for a ballpark, because the long answer to your question, already over 20 came in uh, pre-night. So I was like, let's just turn it into a worship night, not fundraise at all. <laughs> so, um, so that just shows that that's how it gets God's economy, is you think open-handed. I don't have to be careful not to fundraise people for that it would come, no, no, it's all his. So yeah, thanks for asking. Um, I am going to really, like, it's, it's 9 o'clock. I asked until 8.45. Can I, um, my favorite person's in the room. Mom. <laughs> Would you come up, Mom? I want to introduce you. Um, so, most of my friends that have met my mom, and you guys are all my friends, you're meeting my mom. This is my mom, Pam. Do you mind clipping that on your shirt? Um, she had no idea I was going to ever do this. <laughs> My mom is, uh, has been a gift for 40 years, um, and she has believed with equal or more passion and prayer uh, in this ministry um, than I have. She listens every week. She has specific encouragement every week. I have no one else who gives specific encouragement every week. That's a, that's a gift. Thank you. And she shares it more than anyone else. <laughs> she shares the podcast. Um, but she believes in this mission, and I believe in a multiplying prayers, and I was just hoping uh, Mom, that you could pray just a prayer of dependence on God and a prayer of, God, we trust you. And if it's, how many loaves and fish are in the Bible story? Five and two. Five and two. <laughs> Thank you. If it's five and two, I'm going to be thankful. If it's five and two, or if this is an abundance, miraculous, 12 baskets fulls left over. Um, but if you just pray for God's will to be done. Let's put our hands out as we ask God. Father God, you are our Father. And God, we come to you on our knees, in our minds, and with our hands wide open. We feel you carrying us. And right now, the stories that Jeff has shared just give us excitement because we see you're working, God, and we wanna join you in this, this journey. And as we join you, we wanna listen carefully to what you tell us. We ask you to touch each person in this room and those that might be listening through the video. Touch their hearts in a way that is one of excited anticipation, as you say in Romans 8, that we let your spirit lead us. And as your spirit fuels everything that we do, we can trust that you will show us just how to support, not just dad awesome and fathers for the fatherless, but for these families, God, that have no father, to be able to reach out to them in so many amazing ways. And we see this happening, God, in ways that we can't even anticipate. We thank you for the answers this last bike ride and the people that have shared how this touched their lives. So we're gonna thank you in advance for the people here that you're touching that may be able to help financially. And we also say thank you that you are our Father and that we look to you as our example. God, we, we just love you so much and we thank you that you carry us one step at a time, each place that we go, and be with each family now as they leave. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks, Mom. You guys thank my mom.